So while you're all joining, I'll just do a quick introduction. Thanks so much for taking the time to, to join us tonight. Um, hopefully this is going to be really enjoyable and really interesting and we're all going to learn a lot. So first of all, huge, huge thank you to Sarah and to Rob for taking the time to, to join us and to lead this workshop and to Rachel as well, our operational officer, who's done the background on this too with the admin and the setup. So thanks as well, Rachel. Um, so just quickly, um, for anyone that doesn't know about 5K Your Way, um, just a quick summary at the beginning for a little shout out about what we are and what we do. So 5K Your Way is a support group with a difference and it's open to anyone living with or beyond cancer to come along on the last Saturday of the month um, at Park Runs all around the UK. Um, we're super happy to be back after COVID, after a long kind of break apart. And, and so um, we've got now almost 60 groups back up and running or walking or jogging or cheering or volunteering across across the UK and Ireland. So if you're interested and you haven't heard about that or you know someone that might be interested, please do pass along the message and look up 5kyourway.org. Um, and we've also got lots of other um resources we've just launched a move against cancer podcast we've got a youtube channel so there are lots of other things going on resource wise as well as these workshops so you probably hopefully know about some of those because you found us here which is excellent but just giving you a little bit of background as well and we'll include the links when we send out an email afterwards um really quick admin just to say this is going to be recorded but you won't see any of you don't worry you'll only see us that are speaking um and then we'll pop it on our youtube channel so if anyone you know that's that's missing it they can they can watch it again um if we cut out hopefully we won't if there's four of us that have kind of control so if we do cut out someone will come back on hopefully um and i think that's probably oh, we're going to send an email afterwards also with a feedback survey so please take the time that's only going to have a few questions just to improve our workshops for the future um and i think that is everything so hopefully just hand you over to Sarah and then to Rob as well and we're so lucky to have Sarah um, join us again um, she's a clinical exercise specialist I'm gonna hopefully get all these titles right a clinical Pilates instructor and the author of the bowel cancer recovery toolkit as well Sarah I'll let you continue that long list um, but yeah really looking forward to this workshop and thanks so much for joining us so hopefully you'll be able to hear Sarah Hi, everybody. And yes. just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to spotlight myself. Right. So welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, and uh, I'm joined with Rob. Um, Rob is a, a client of mine and um, a bowel cancer patient, although I use, don't like to use the word patient, um, and he's going to come in in around 20 minutes time. So I'm going to do some slides first and do a little 20 minute talk. And then Rob and I are going to talk about his journey and his experience of exercise during and after his treatment and many surgeries. Um, and then there's going to be about 20 minutes for questions at the end. So I'm kind of also set up to do any demos um, if we get to that point as well. So it's kind of going to be very much if you've got questions, we can go through that. The title of this is really about core exercises, specifically after abdominal surgery. And that is whether whatever type of abdominal surgery it is, whether it's um, for bowel cancer, um, gynecological cancers, or you know, different types of, of cancer, whatever you've had your surgery for, whether you've got a stoma or not, I'm going to cover all of that in this workshop. Um, and it's very specifically about core exercises. So not just about general exercise, really focus on the cans and the can'ts. We'll get to that, um, about what you can and can't do. Talk a little bit about hernias as well and kind of just dig into that a little bit. So let me um, share my slides and hopefully I'm spotlighting my screen. I don't know if that's working or not. It's all very confusing. <laughs> right. Okay. Here we go. So hopefully that's working. There we go. Right. So we are very much talking about abdominal exercise after surgery. So a little bit um, more about me. I am a clinical exercise specialist, clinical Pilates teacher, um, cancer rehabilitation specialist, and I have lived with a stoma myself 
um, since 2010, which wasn't for bowel cancer, it was for um, a different bowel condition, but I subsequently had five abdominal surgeries, three different stomas. And when I was going through that journey, I really felt hugely um, let down by the lack of kind of information and support there was around abdominal exercises and exercise about you know, anything about after, after surgery. And I had had a, I had a master's degree in sport and exercise science, and I'd been working in the fitness industry for 20 years at that point, and I didn't know what to do. So I thought, hang on a minute, if I don't know what to do, how does anybody else even figure this out? So I asked nurses, physios, surgeons, no one really seemed to know. There were bits and pieces out there. So over the last sort of 10 years, I've really worked hard to try and bring this to the table and provide some more support for people going through abdominal surgery. I'm also the global exercise consultant for Combatech. I work at Hospice in the Weald, where I volunteer a day a week, um, and I do clinical Pilates online through the Ostomy Studio. Um, I'm also a runner. I've just done my 43rd marathon, um, and you know that's just because that's how I love getting out and about and doing various things in the on the trails and the mountains. So that's about me. Right. So right now. You may have had surgery, it may have been ages ago, you may have just had it, or you may be actually about to have it. How confident do you feel about abdominal exercise? Now, I don't want you to put this in the chat, I just want you to sort of store this in your head. So where would you put yourself on that scale? One, being not very confident, 10, being very confident. We'll revisit this at the end of this workshop. So we're going to talk about the importance of core rehab after surgery. That is very different to getting back into exercise. So what we have to think about is the abdominal wall has had trauma through the surgery and we have to rehabilitate that in the way we would rehabilitate any other part of the body that has had an injury. But it's, it's this gap which is hugely missed. So if someone has knee surgery or hip surgery or, or breast cancer, they're often given rehabilitation exercises. And these are done very early on after surgery. And then what happens is six weeks, 12 weeks down the line, you start to sort of get back into doing normal exercise. What I've just thought, what I've discovered in bowel and in gynae and in any kind of abdominal surgery is there's this huge, vast gap. And you might be given a few breathing exercises by the physio, you might walk up and down the ward a bit, but there's nothing specifically about core rehab. And that is absolutely essential. We need to rehabilitate the area that's had trauma to it. So kind of store that in your head as this isn't about getting back into exercise. This is about rehabilitating. So we need to think about it as this foundation. So right at the bottom of this foundation, we've got diaphragmatic breathing. Then we move up into kind of specific core exercises. Now, these are rehab exercises. These are not the sort of things you'd see done in a gym or in a fitness class. And then we move into kind of general conditioning. And you'll see I've written especially arm strength. So there isn't actually any evidence on this at the moment. But one of my kind of hypotheses at the moment is that re really important arm strength we need to bring into the picture a little bit sooner to take the strain off the core. So doing some sort of seated bicep curls with some light weights early on in, in the rehab process is actually really important. Then we move up the pyramid and we start going back to kind of sports and exercises. Now, what generally happens is if you imagine the very bottom of that triangle is your surgery, people are advised to kind of just go home, they rest, they might not do anything. And then they kind of want to jump back to the box at number four at the top six weeks, 12 weeks after their surgery. So what we have to do is put these steps in place. It's not just as simple as rest for six weeks and then go back. So we have to put steps in place. And that starts with diaphragmatic breathing. I'm going to demo that in a minute and show you what that looks like. Then we move into some very specific core exercises. Then we move into general conditioning and we build up the pyramid. So let's think about the core. What do we actually mean when we talk about the core? So people talk about the core and they think it's kind of the front of the body, the anterior abdominal wall, maybe the rectus muscle, that six pack down the front. What we actually need to talk about when we talk about the core is this deep internal canister. It has a top and a bottom and it has a side, wraps around it. 
Now the top is the diaphragm, the bottom is the pelvic floor, and we've got this transverse abdominus muscle which wraps around. And then we've got some sort of little muscles in the back called the multifidus. We need to think about that as the deep internal core. So imagine that as a canister deep inside of you. And we have to restore function to that before we start to strengthen it. So diaphragmatic breathing restores function to the pelvic floor and the diaphragm as they move up and down together. So all of those muscles on this picture are interconnected and they work as a unit. We cannot just isolate one, move, one muscle. So if we're trying to rehabilitate the abdominal wall, like the transverse abdominus, we've got to rehabilitate the whole thing, which is why breathing and func getting function of that diaphragm is super, super important right from the very start. So let's have a look at just a reflection question. So according to the ASCM, which is the Association of Stoma Care Nurses. Now, these are nurses who look after anybody who's had a colostomy bag or an ileostomy. So that won't necessarily apply to everybody listening. Um, but if we then just think about this in the, in the context of if someone with a stoma has had surgery, that means somebody who's had any kind of abdominal surgery, it would be relevant to. So according to nursing clinical guidelines, when can somebody start to do abdominal exercises? Is it three to four weeks, three to four months, or three to four days after surgery? Now, you might not know the answer. I'm not expecting you to. But the answer is three to four days. Now, this is a clinical guideline. Now, it was only in 2016, so it takes quite a while before guidelines start to become in sort of practice. So really important to think that actually one of our guidelines is we need to start rehabilitating this abdominal wall within reason three to four days after surgery. Let's talk about hernias very briefly. Um, so for those of you who do have stomas, but let's imagine that this is any kind of hernia where you've got any kind of incision on the abdominal wall. So where we have an incision or where we have um, a, a stoma that's come through the abdominal wall, we just have a increased risk of hernia. So a parastomal hernia or any kind of incisional hernia is where we've got little loops of bowel and they've just kind of come through the abdominal wall. So you can see the kind of muscle and then we've got the skin. Now they are really common and there's a lot of fear around developing hernias, particularly around the stoma. Um, but I think, you know, the likelihood is very high that we will develop a, a hernia of some description. Um, and I think we need to remove a lot of the fear around them and we need to kind of start to learn to live with them rather than trying to um, maybe try and prevent them, which I'm not entirely sure we can do. So I'm very much around quality of life and living the best life you can um, and reducing the risk. So let's just think very quickly, what is the incidence of parastomal hernia and what is the incidence of incisional hernia? So a, a parastomal hernia is a hernia around a stoma. An incisional hernia is a hernia where you've just had any kind of incision on the abdominal wall, whether that's been a um, hysterectomy scar, whether that's a midline incision, or whether that's where you've had a stoma reversal. Um, and the incidence of parastomal hernia is around 70%, and that's in anybody who's had a, had a stoma surgery. And the incidence in incisional hernias, just have a think in your head, what might it be? Um, it's about 30%. So you've still got a risk of some kind of hernia, even if you don't have a stoma. So what I'm trying to say here is not to be scared of doing core exercises. What we have to do is exercise safely and exercise in appropriate ways to reduce the risk. What we don't want to do is go all gung-ho and start to do really strong abdominal exercises and things that we might do in a gym if we're not ready for it and increase our risk. So we have to find that sweet spot between not being scared to do things, but respecting our, our surgery that we've had. So risk factors for hernias, these are particularly around parastomal hernias, but they probably apply to all sorts of hernias. So age, as we get older, the muscles get weaker, increase the risk, number of surgeries you've had, if you've got a lot of complications, you've had infections. Um, if you're male, you're more likely to develop a hernia. 
Um, now, these are risk factors. I'm not saying that if you have these things, you will get a hernia. These are just risk factors. So being overweight and having a larger abdominal girth, smoking and drinking alcohol seem to increase the risk. Smoking, particularly because of the coughing and the pressure. Having any kind of respiratory conditions such as COPD, even asthma, or even sort of things like chronic sinus things, or even hay fever where you're sneezing a lot. So anything that increases pressure, coughing, sneezing, vomiting, um, blowing your nose, those sorts of things. So avoiding COVID is actually really important when we've got stomas, when we've had abdominal surgeries, particularly in the first year. Having a diagnosis of cancer because having chemotherapy will affect tissue healing, having diverticulitis or a AAA, having some kind of treatment with steroids. And then we've got this kind of purple box, which is raised intra-abdominal pressure. And I want you to think about a balloon. So imagine a great big long sausage balloon. And I want you to imagine you squeeze the bottom of it and the pressure goes from the bottom and the top starts to bulge up. Squeeze the top, you push it down, the pressure comes to the bottom. So what you're doing is moving pressure around inside that balloon. I want you to imagine that internal canister like a balloon that you're squeezing the pressure around in. So when you lift or cough or sneeze or vomit, um, that pressure starts to move around within your body. And we need to learn to manage our intra-abdominal pressure. Come on to that in a little bit in a while, particularly with Rob, we're going to talk about that. Um, having diabetes, having a colostomy um, rather than an ileostomy, there's a little bit more risk because the hole's a bit bigger. And abdominal wall muscle atrophy, that atrophy just means loss of muscle. So if you have lost a lot of muscle or you're particularly weak on your abdominal wall. Um, some research that I did when we talked to people with stoma, so I'm not going to read all of these out. I'm just going to pick a couple of things out and you may relate to this yourself. So advice on physical activity would be really useful. I'm still careful of certain exercises. I'm scared to exercise in case I get a hernia. Um, too often people are told, told not advised that the do's and don'ts, um, physical rehab should be standard practice. Um, I was told no heavy lifting for six weeks, nothing more than a kettle, then what, who knows, aftercare should include visit for the physio. So this is the problem. There's a lot of um, fear, a lot of sort of lack of understanding and lack of awareness about how to start, how, you know, where do we even start? What do we do? So what happens is we have our surgery, we have our treatment, we might even have a diagnosis of a hernia. And we start to lose trust in our body. That, that happens when you have a cancer diagnosis. It happens when you've had any kind of um, surgery or illness, actually. Even a, even a sports injury, we lose confidence in our body. It's let us down. Without an intervention, we then go on this spiral. So we can then become inactive. We, lost, we lose muscle. We maybe just Because we just don't even know where to start. We're scared to start. We're worried about causing a problem or making things worse. Then maybe we kind of get a bit more pain. We start getting backache. We feel a bit weaker, a bit more wobbly on our feet, a bit more scared of moving. Then we get a bit more deconditioning. We have reduced quality of life. And I was working with a patient just a couple of weeks ago, and he's in his young guy in his 30s, and he was too scared to even pick up his baby um, because he's been told he might get a hernia. And this is six months after surgery. So he hasn't had any interventional support put in place to say, this is what to do to strengthen those muscles to enable you to lift and pick up your child. So those pink arrows show where we can put an intervention in place. So we can talk about before surgery, or we can talk about after surgery. Um, and that intervention would be a really simple rehab program. So breathing exercises, core exercises, things you can do in bed, things you can do on the floor at home. And that's where you would start. If you are quite far beyond surgery, then you still start with the same thing and the same protocol. I'm going to move on from that. Um, so if we think about all those risk factors of hernias, um, what we need to do is reduce the risk factors. So we need to mitigate against the things which are in our, within our control. So we can't change aging, but we can change our biological age in the sense that we can remain as fit and active for as long as possible. If weak abdominals are a risk, then we need to strengthen them, but we need to do that correctly with correct technique. Smoking and alcohol, if they're risk factors, then we need to minimize um, smoking and min minimize alcohol consumption. Heavy lifting, 
Now, the, there's a big thing around heavy lifting. So a lot of people don't lift heavy weights. They don't lift shopping. They don't lift heavy suitcases. They're scared of lifting. Um, but heavy lifting, it's something's only heavy if you're not, if you can't tolerate that weight. So for some people, a kettle might be very heavy in the early days. For somebody much further down the line, you know, a, a I don't know, a 40 kilo dumbbell might not be heavy. So it kind of depends on you, the individual, and what heavy means to you. But whatever the, that item is, you need to be strong enough in order to lift it. And you need to have good lifting technique. Um, being overweight and having a bigger waist circumference is a risk factor. Um, so where possible, you know, if you can implement some weight loss or weight management, that's going to help. And we need to minimize anything that causes a lot of coughing and vomiting. So I am trying to avoid getting COVID as much as possible. Um, and really anybody who's got any kind of abdominal, um, has had abdominal surgery, really needs to try and avoid kind of coughing or vomiting. Uh, I'm not going to do that. So let's look at this transverse abdominus muscle. Um, that's where it is. It kind of sits from the bottom rib round to the back and it comes onto the pelvis. That's our key muscle that we need to work on. So diaphragmatic breathing, I'm going to demo that in a second. Diaphragmatic breathing is where the ribs open and close. And if we think about that transverse abdominus, the diaphragm at the top, the pelvic floor at the bottom, we need to reconnect that whole group of muscles. So that's number one exercise. And these are typical post-op exercises. So we've got a pelvic tilt. So you can do it on all fours. You can do it lying in a bed. And we start to tilt that pelvis backwards and forth with control. We've got a simple exercise of knee rolls and rolling your knees back. And then another exercise where you keep control of those abdominals and one knee drops out to the side. So you're creating stability and just allowing one knee to drop. So these are just examples of super easy, gentle starting point exercises that you can do in bed or on the floor. So we've got a little bridge where you lift your bottom off the floor and then we've got a leg slide where your leg slides away. So these are very classic kind of um, starting point exercises. Now you're probably familiar with some of those. Um, <clears throat> we, those are the sorts of things that that guideline three to four days post-op we'd start to think about introducing in a really gentle way what we then move on to when we've got through that phase remember that diagram with the with the pyramid we start to work up we start to build our increase our tolerance of load increase the strength within our muscles then we can move into other things so we can move into like a little tiny sit-up we can move into things like a modified plank but we start to do them really gently phase by phase by phase and what that does yes it's building your physical ability to do it but it also builds your confidence because one of the things that almost everybody says post-op is they're really scared to exercise and scared to do core exercises I'm going to bring Rob in now. Um, Rob is um, uh, we go. There we go. So, hi, Rob. Can we, I can't hear you. I don't think. Can we hear you? Can, I, can anybody hear Rob? Yeah, there you go. Cool. So, Rob is. Um, a really amazing client of mine. He came to me about this time last year, I think it might be, just before he had, uh, just before when he had a diagnosis of bowel cancer, and he um, he then had surgery. He had a stoma. We worked together again about ten days after his surgery. Worked through, got him really fit. Then he's had his reversal. We worked together before that. And we've been working together after that. So he's had experience of doing abdominal core exercises at different phases. Now, one of the highlights of, of the work I've done over the last year is getting a message from Rob saying, I've just gone out on my surfboard for the first time since my diagnosis. Um, and that was an amazing, um, you know, sort of pathway to go from where he'd gone right to, to that. So, Rob, um, just, you know, tell us a little bit about your story and just tell us a little bit about kind of, yeah, where, where you've 
how you've gone through that journey? So um, I was diagnosed with bowel cancer in sort of June 2019, and I had sort of chemo radiotherapy. Um, it was quite a good exercise program where I had my radiotherapy. I went through that. There was lots of talk about, oh, you need to be really careful about intra-abdominal pressure, all that kind of stuff, but didn't really explain really what that meant. Um, did a little bit of sort of flip-flopping around exercise programs before I was sort of waiting to have my surgery. Um, and then I think I was just Googling and found your book. So I sort of thought, well, I'll give you a call and see um, what, what can happen. And then you actually, we had something booked in, I believe. And then I got rushed into hospital to sort of beat the COVID wave. And I remember we had a phone call just beforehand and you said, right, just settle down, practice a few things the night before, just so that you kind of know what you're looking for in the exercises that you can do afterwards. And I would say I was really pretty fit beforehand as well. I, you know, and I genuinely always have done, have felt pretty fit. Um, so then I had surgery and it was COVID time. So even if there had been any opportunity for sort of physio and things, I don't think that would have been available. So we worked together quite a lot. And I was very nervous about where I was going to, you know, would I be able to surf again? I've got two small children. Am I going to be able to sort of play with them, lift them up, all those sorts of things. Um, and I, we was also having chemotherapy when we were working together. And then since then, I've sort of got myself to a really good level of fitness, you know, and in some ways fitter than I have ever been before. And then I had a reversal, which got delayed and delayed and delayed. And we worked together before that. We did a little prehab program. And now I'm about five months after having my reversal. I'm back surfing again. I went back to the gym a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, I have got COVID in my house. My daughter's got it. So I'm not sure I'm going to avoid that. Um, and that's sort of roughly my story, really. That's brilliant. Thank you. So can we dig into specifically about some of the exercises and the way in which you built back up? Because a lot of the advice that people are given is start slowly, build up gently. But what does that actually mean? And how does that differ for individuals? Because I know, you know what that means for me, but that's going to mean something different for somebody else. And they may push themselves too much or they may not do enough. So Think back to that time when you said you were nervous um, about whether you were going to be able to go surfing. At that point, you had your stoma. You had like your stoma temp for a temporary period of time. Um, we started doing exercises about 10 days after that surgery, if I remember rightly. Can you just talk through some of the things you did then and how it felt? Um, so it was things that probably beforehand I wouldn't have even necessarily thought of as as sort of exercises as such so it was it was the pelvic tilts it was um dropping my knees I distinctly remember you showed me a, a sort of particular way of getting up that would sort of not put any pressure on but I, what I just was doing that every day um and just kind of as much as it was sort of learning to feel the muscles and feel what was happening so engaging that core and a lot of those things I still do now and have done before I do any kind of exercise, I sort of do those almost to, to pre-activate my core. But yeah, I, I would say very basic things that maybe you, at the beginning, if you've done any level of exercise before, you don't even feel like you're necessarily doing exercise, but in a very sort of mindful manner to try and build sort of just some control and also sort of some movement patterns into what you're doing whilst kind of learning how it feels as well because it yeah. all feels that's awful. that's that's it you spot on you, you like you literally like just explained it perfectly and I think you're right it's that feeling of I remember saying to you these are going to feel really lame to you these exercises but roll with it let's just do it because that's one of the mistakes people make is they think it needs to be hard or they think they need to be like a gym exercise and actually you're right it's about retraining connection retraining function of those muscles that deep inner core and learning how to move again having had trauma to your abdominal wall and that's that's exactly it and that builds confidence but it also builds functional capacity of your core 
So then what happens? So you let's move along a few weeks from those little lame exercises. Let's move along a little bit and start to think about, okay, you're starting to move up the ladder, up that pyramid. How did that feel? And what sort of things were you, did you start to do? So um, we were we were starting to layer slightly more complicated um, exercises. So um, the sort of sliding our legs along, my legs along the floor became sort of lifting my legs up and doing a more sort of scissors type exercise. So there's just a little bit more um, sort of stress or going through the same principles, just sort of building that up. So focusing on breathing through all of that, which really makes a big difference to how your core and the pressure within if you really focus on your breathing and slowly build those exercises up so you're not struggling through those exercises while you're doing it you can kind of focus on doing it correctly and then sort of move up when that becomes really really easy then you move up to the next thing and then we yeah we introduce you know I've got a little gym in my um garage and we started introducing some bicep curls and some presses overhead and and again it was felt really light um because i've been moving weights a lot more than that but it it felt really good and to build it up slowly felt really good i would say the second time if anything i because i probably i only had the surgery to close my stoma i didn't have the open wound as well but i sort of maybe felt like i rushed slightly ahead mm. and actually i remember speaking to you and i sort of came i had to sort of just double down on going back to that really focusing on the core exercises and then just layering things overhead and then just becoming aware of certain things that that may be increased pressure so trying not necessarily to do something push-ups are quite a tricky one so really building those up slowly even though you might have the arm strength and the chest strength to do them just really slowly introducing introducing them and making sure that you breathe through them get your form through them that I think that's how we did it I think we just layered it very very slowly yeah I love that so there's three things I want to pick up on there one is this kind of concept of layering and layering is is almost like you you said it perfectly you almost like master an exercise until it feels super easy and then you add the next level and that might be as simple as moving an arm or it might be adding a really small weight or it might be doing it with a ball under your hips or, or doing it in a slightly different way, which changes the load, which changes the challenge of the exercise. So we are progressing through these exercises with like little minute nibbles of layers and just changing them subtly. Um, you talk about breathing. Um, breathing out and exhaling is one of the most important things we can do. So whenever we're doing a particular exercise or going to lift something, Breathing out, so exhaling at the effort of it, whether it's lifting a weight or doing a, a particular exercise, that breathing out helps you manage your intra-abdominal pressure. So intra-abdominal pressure is a problem because that increases our risk of hernia and increases risk of strain around any incision sites. So we need to learn to modify and moderate and manage our pressure as much as possible. Because if we think about that balloon that we're squeezing when we squeeze that balloon and the and the pressure builds up if there's a little tiny hole in that balloon that's where the pressure is going to go to that weak spot and that's your incision or that's your stoma site and that's how we get hernias is we've put we've overloaded a weak spot without the ability to tolerate the pressure and you're right so what we do is we're managing stress and load and pressure on the abdomen um, but breathing out is probably the most important thing you can you can kind of learn as a really quick fix tip. That's super important. Um, yeah, so I think that was kind of what you were talking about: pressure, breathing out, and kind of layering. Um, and then you were starting to get back into those kind of conditioning exercises. So you are moving up that pyramid perfectly. When did you first feel like you could kind of go surfing, and at, at what stage did you do that from memory? Well, I was a little bit limited because obviously it was COVID and lockdowns and I was having chemotherapy. So that was a bit of a issue, but I think I went surfing about four or five months after having surgery. Um, the first time was a little bit of a um, shock because I'd um, had oxyplatin and it has this um, sort of 
tingling effect and I went surfing and um, felt like my whole head was pins and needles. But shortly after that, <laughs> uh, but again, I sort of used a similar approach. Um, I started, I just went back on a foamy surfboard and slowly built up, got a really good friend who helped me kind of work, sort of came out and he's far better surfer than me, but just, you know, he joined me in it. So I didn't feel like it was on my own. And then, and very quickly, um, I was back to kind of surfing pretty well and enjoying myself. So surfing is a very core, um, I, I mean, I'm not a big surfer, I've done it a little bit, but from what I know, it, you need really good core strength, particularly when you're getting up on the board and you're standing and you, they, you know, it, so how did that feel that first time you were surfing? You've got that stoma, you've got that, that surgical incision, you're four months down the line. How did it feel when you first got up on that surfboard? Um, it felt okay, but again, we'd kind of gone back and thought, okay, what was the pro what are we going to need to do to do that? So we kind of worked on bringing my legs up sort of towards my chest so that that, that moment of getting to my feet was I practiced and that I'd got my muscles were kind of ready for that. Um, so it, it sort of, it, it didn't, it felt, I felt comfortable because I'd done the work beforehand to kind of get to so that. That's really interesting. And I'd actually forgotten we did that. So what a really good way to get back to doing something, whether it's golf, tennis, um, running, cycling, surfing, whatever it might be, is you start to replicate a movement to rebuild your strength and you'll replicate the movement to enable you then to do that movement safely. So you're doing it in a, a safe, controlled, supervised manner on the mat, kind of practicing that getting onto the surfboard before you go and do it for real. And the same with golf or tennis. So with, with golfers, I have people with like stretchy therabands practicing the golf swing in a controlled environment in a gym or in their house with it tied onto the fridge practicing that movement before they start using. So they're building the functional ability, but they're also building their confidence that when they go and do it for real. So it's all about, we've layered up, we've introduced a, an exercise, which is kind of replicating the thing you're gonna go and do, and then you go and do the thing, and then it feels safe. Yeah, I think that's exactly, uh, and then you feel confident as well, which I think helps you to then move properly. I think if you're not very confident, you're sort of tense and then you're probably more likely to mm. or hurt yourself as well and and let's talk a little bit about kind of because there's a lot of things that the title of this webinar was things you can and can't do so if we think about running marathons we think about surfing we think about a lot of the things that we hear other people doing with stomas and the kind of or, or after any kind of abdominal surgery people can go back and do pretty much anything right so when we say about this there's this kind of nothing you can't do. It's with a caveat, isn't it? A little bit. There's kind of like, we need to say, there's nothing you can't do, but it depends. Yeah, I'd say there's, there's nothing you can't do, but you probably need maybe a bit of a roadmap to get there. Yeah. And then also sort of in terms of going to the gym and things, there's nothing you can't do, but actually is that worth it for me? So one of the things that I used to do, but actually I'm just not sure I will do any anymore, is a squat with a barbell on my back because mm. that's going to put a lot of pressure into abdominal pressure. Find something else that replicates that. And then do I need to do that? If I really want to, I'm sure I could. And I've seen plenty of people that power lift with stomas and having abdominal surgery, but I think both the case, if you really want to do something, you can get a roadmap to do it. And the yeah. other thing, is that really what I want to do? Is there something else I can do instead that does the same thing for me? If yeah. that's kind of what you want, you know, I think it's a bit of a, a bit of a risk assessment, I guess, in a way. And I love that because Rob, I'd forgot to mention this, Rob's a pilot. So risk assessing and kind of meticulous attention to detail is his middle name um and i think you're you're absolutely spot on is that yes you need a roadmap so it's not just a case of like someone has surgery rest for six weeks and then go back to doing whatever you want six weeks later because that's not right you need a roadmap 
but you all, it needs to also be the right roadmap for you as an individual, depending on where you're coming from, the type of surgery you've had and where you're going. And like you've just perfectly sort of pinpointed, there's nothing you can't do, but you might want to do it in a different way to modify that pressure. So when we're talking about this pressure, it's, it's something that you really feel. So it's a feeling of bulging, of doming, of kind of tightness, or how would you describe it, Rob? Because it's, it's something, it's quite hard to describe, isn't it? How would you describe it when you feel like you've, put, you've got too much pressure and you're not managing it well? Um, it sort of feels like something's trying to escape, I would say, almost. <laughs> you've got sort of like, it's trying to get out because there's a weak point there. And it's, it, um, I mean, I, I hope I've probably been pretty good at managing it because I've been aware of it from the beginning but I think that's probably I'm probably thinking back to things I've done beforehand it's that kind of moment where you're kind of really really grimacing through something that you're trying to do um whether it's garden or it's gym or it's climbing a wall or something it's that kind of moment where you sort of you're holding your breath and you're just trying to push through something um and then when you've got some kind of weakness in your stomach it kind of it you, you can feel it pushing against mm, it yeah yeah that I mean that's brilliant it's that it's the grimacing and breath holding and kind of a feeling of bulging and something trying to get out and and it's that feeling that we want to avoid as much as possible so if you're doing something whether it's in the garden or lifting or whatever um or a particular exercise that's where we need to stop when you start feeling that so of course, the grimacing and the breath holding, you can manage because just don't grimace or manage a weight that doesn't make you grimace and breathe, breathe out on the exertion all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so where you are now in terms of core exercises, let's just sort of pin down onto those. You've had your reversal. Are there any core exercises that you now modify, avoid? Which one's your go-tos? Where are you at now? So I tend to, before I do anything, um, so I sort of went back to the gym about three weeks ago. Um, I've got a really good trainer. We kind of go in, he, we look at the, the program. So it's a program, sort of a small group training sort of set up. And we look at, I'll go in a few minutes early and I'll look at the program and say, right, I think I should do this. I won't do that. And I do a little sort of pre-activation sort of stuff beforehand. Just so, explain, explain what that is. So, um, so that's basically a lot of the things you showed at the beginning. Um, so I do some pelvic tilts. I do um, some leg drops, but on the ball, just to kind of make sure that I'm feeling my deeper abdominal muscles. Um, I do some kind of leg extension type of stuff just to get sort of comfortable. And um, there's sort of a modified sort of plank variation that I do. Um, and then I'm just avoiding certain things at the moment. I'm not quite there. We did a um, the gym that I go to. We do a lot of kettlebell stuff. We do a, a, what's called a Turkish get up. And there's just one part of the Turkish get up which just feels like it puts a little bit of pressure on me. So at the moment, I've stopped doing that, and I've kind of adapted it so I come come down rather than start on the floor. So that initial twisting motion I don't do, then that's relieved okay. pressure. And probably in a couple of months time, we'll sort of go back and revisit it and see how it feels. But um, so and then, this, this pre-activation thing, I'm really interested in because that's quite that's not something that many people would do. They'd want to just move on. Um, I know how important it is. Um, but what we're talking about there is, as you just said, it's kind of doing some really small movements to wake up those deep muscles. So that when you go and do something more strenuous, they're kind of kicking in and joining the party and working for you. Is that how, is that how you would describe it? What, what does it feel like it's doing? Yeah, so it, it certainly enables them when I move, I, I kind of know I can feel that they're engaged and that I'm almost, it's almost like a protective band around, around. But it also, it also kind of gives me that's just the feeling right okay I know how that feels I know that's feeling good today so that then when I actually do something I can it's sort of just kind of almost tuning in to the feeling mm. of yeah 
It's like um, tu it's tuning it up, isn't it, before you do something more strenuous. Um, so I'm kind of conscious of time. We've got 15 minutes left. Before we move into some questions, um, I want to ask you about support garments. So for people who, who've got stomas, a lot of people will, will want to wear support, some kind of support they've been told to. So can I just ask you your experience of wearing anything like that? And where, yeah, what, what would you kind of say you, your experiences of that? Um, I, I hated them. Uh, I've, I, found them, I found them just kind of, when I had a stoma, they just caused it to leak rather than anything else. Um, and actually, I think, if anything, they stop you properly engaging your core because you're kind of relying on this other thing. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure they work, um, but I've, yeah. seen a lot, I've seen a lot of things on Facebook where people are doing kind of crazy stuff and they think because they're wearing this support garment, it'll all be fine. Um, and I kind of, I, 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 bought, I bought two of them, um, didn't really like them, found them kind of uncomfortable. They moved mm. around. And the only thing was sort of some of those sort of high-waisted kind of underwear things I wore surfing just because getting in now the wetsuit was a bit, but that was probably the only thing I would say. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, that's my view as well. And um, personally, um, I think if you've got a hernia and it's very uncomfortable, then that's a time to wear support. But I think there's probably something, and there's no research on this yet, but there's probably something around that they stop the muscles working properly. So particularly when we're doing exercise and that pre-activation stuff where we're trying to wake up that deep core, um, that's the bit that interrupts, I think. So for people who are coming to my classes and people that I'm working with, I often encourage them to take it off. Um, okay, so we've got about 13 minutes left. Um, I wanna kind of invite some questions. So you can pop a question in the chat um, for me or for Rob or for both of us, or you can um, just come off mute and just ask a question or make a comment or anything you would like. So Georgie, have we got any questions that have come in or has anybody got any questions probably wave if you uh, have yeah either wave i'll pop at mine on gallery view and i can see or pop start writing it in the chat box but to kick us off while everyone's kind of thinking someone that that couldn't attend was actually asking how and i know you kind of answered this in the presentation sarah was asking how soon to is it the same amount of time to start doing core exercises for everyone after surgery they were asking and so I know you said in that presentation three to four days but would that be exactly the same for everyone no so it it totally depends on um the type of surgery you've had how complex it is um how well you are whether you're out of intensive care and also kind of a little bit on how unwell you were going into surgery so for me, on my, one of my very first surgeries, I was super fit. I had a really acute episode. I was unwell for a really short period of time. It was emergency surgery. I came out and I recovered really quickly. So actually, for me, I was able to get back to that really quickly. And that three to four days thing is probably about right. Um, for somebody who's having very extensive surgery that may involve the, perf the, the pelvic floor or it may involve... Um, it, you know, very complex surgery. Um, they may have more than one stoma. They may have more than one incision. Um, they may be very unwell or there's complications or infection or they've got an open wound. You would want to wait. So, but that doesn't stop them doing diaphragmatic breathing and it doesn't stop them doing from kind of gentle connection of the core in those very early days. Um, so yeah so that's kind of yeah so three to four days is kind of the let's start there if we can but if, if someone's very unwell they've had very extensive surgery then you'd wait a little bit but probably not that much more so yeah okay so I can see some questions that have come in if you do get a hernia do you need to do things differently or it's the same advice um it's the same advice so it, people with a stoma almost 70 percent of people will get a hernia um I've got one, it's small, it's not getting any bigger, it's managed. Um, and actually, it's even more important to follow that advice. So the management around exhaling, breathing, core activation prior to doing any sort of exercises. Um, so yeah, so so I would say, um, 
Oh, they're all flying in now. Great questions. <laughs> um, okay, so no, it's it's the same advice. Yes, same advice. And you still need to strengthen your your abdomen. We've just been doing a trial called the Holt trial. So Google it to Holt Turn Your Active Living trial. Um, and we've been looking at introducing core exercises, all the exercise I've been talking about to people with hernias, and it actually people start to build that internal support garment. Uh, do you incorporate the Valsalva maneuver to help long-term osmates with pelvic floor since many of them are no longer passing stool? So we, the Valsalva maneuver is something where you um, you kind of hold your breath to try and increase intra-abdominal pressure, which in the powerlifting world and in the kind of weightlifting world helps you actually lift more weight. So what we want to try and avoid, and this is in the association, um, it's the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines, is to avoid the mouse valsalva maneuver so the valsalva maneuver is something where you basically hold your breath and kind of brace we want to avoid that so we want to um so the breathing exercise diaphragmatic breathing the diaphragm this is a tin of chickpeas the diaphragm is the top the bottom is the pelvic floor the diaphragm and the pelvic floor work in synergy together so the pelvic floor is almost like a second diaphragm and they move up and down together so when we breathe when we breathe in I'll just demo this standing up. When we breathe in and the lungs fill, the pelvic floor and the diaphragm move down. When we breathe out and the lungs get smaller, the diaphragm lifts up and the pelvic floor comes with it. So in order to get good function of the pelvic floor, which is very important for people after stoma surgery, even if they've got um, the, bowel, the bowel is now bypassed, they've still, pelvic floor is still a muscle, still needs to be incorporated. Diaphragmatic breathing and these exercises are still really, really important early, early on. So we want to avoid Valsalva maneuver, which is breath holding and bracing. And we want to introduce breathing exercises to work on the diaphragm and pelvic floor working together. Um, oh gosh, lots of questions. <laughs> Would you advise practicing some of the exercises pre-surgery to engage the right muscles? If so, which ones? Yes, absolutely. Like Rob did, even the night before to learn diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and so that's lateral breathing and then a kind of connection of the core. Something like a pelvic tilt, something like knee rolls, just learning how to activate those muscles. And like Rob said at the beginning, what it feels like, if you can learn that, just a few days before that's going to make a really really big difference breathing is your number one um pelvic tilting is probably the number two and you can do that in a variety of different positions learning how to pull those lower deep abdominal muscles in um like a connection of that transverse abdominus is really key and even in someone who's got very extensive surgery they may be having pelvic floor surgery they can do that on their side in bed as well so that's uh yeah definitely um, how often would you recommend to do the core exercises? Great question. Um, Rob, how often did you do them? I think when I started, it was because it was only doing like 10, 15 minutes, maybe a day. And I'd kind of do it every day, I think. And then I guess as you kind of work up that, that kind of ladder to get sort of and layering a bit more complex stuff, then less often. So now when I'm what? now sort of five months after a surgery it's probably i'm doing kind of two more kind of pilates sessions a week and then doing core exercises at the gym so probably like four times a week now but i think at the beginning you're really not doing very much it's not it's mm. not certainly not expending a huge amount of energy yeah so you can do it and you, the stuff you're doing at the beginning you can just do you wake up in the morning and in bed you do yeah. some pelvic tilts and yeah and Leg perfect drops. that's perfect that's how i would recommend as well so initially it's little and often it's like think of it as like salt and you're sprinkling it through your day and you just want to do a few little exercises almost throughout the day here and there or even a short like 10 minute thing as you progress and get stronger move up that pyramid it becomes like i mean i do two sessions of core a week now and then other stuff so um so yeah i think you're right i think it, it's little and often to begin with certainly post-op you're looking at probably something every day but just connection very easy and then when you're further down the line and you're into maintenance you're looking at a couple of times a week for a very specific core um thing 
So ultimately, we want the core muscles to work without us really having to do much about it. They want to work as part of the body. We, they want, they're working for us all the time, but we need to rehab them in order to do that. Um, if you leave it too long to start exercises after surgery, can that result in a permanent weakness? Um, no. I've been working with a client who has had her stoma for 44 years, has never done exercises, has developed a hernia, and she has made a massive um, improvement and made huge progress. So it is never too late. Um, so there's no such thing as a permanent weakness. You can always strengthen those muscles. Um, but we create function first. We engage them. We learn how they feel. Then we move to strengthening. So we want to reconnect our mind with those muscles first, learn how to breathe, learn how to get that connection, then strengthen. How important are pelvic floor exercises? Um, they're essential, really, um, but we don't want to just think about the pelvic floor in isolation. We want to think about the pelvic floor as this connected unit to the whole deep core. So it's the second diaphragm. It moves up and down with the diaphragm. It's connected to that deep transverse. The whole thing works together. So we need to think about that as a unit. Um, so diaphragmatic breathing is your starting point. As you're feeling that diaphragm lift up and down, think about pulling the pelvic floor up and down as well. Very, very important if you are planning a reversal surgery, if you had a stoma surgery, if you've had surgery involving the pelvic floor, um, if you've had some kind of reconstruction, that is still really important because it's an important function of the whole core. Um, Rob, you've had your um, reversal. We did about a bit of pelvic floor work before that. What would you say about pelvic floor? Um, I think it's, it's more than just doing your sort of Kegel stuff. Mm. It's, it's kind of learning to engage everything. So kind of glutes, muscles, you know, your, your deep abdominal, it kind of all works together. Yeah. But I did that and it seemed to come together pretty well. Okay. So cool. Um, yeah, I think um, it's, it's probably more, it's more than just doing the sort of the, yeah. the typical Kegel stuff is what I would yeah, say. It, it, yeah, you're right. It, it, it's more than just doing your Kegels and your squeezes. It has to be integrated. And then if we think about the deep core and you mentioned glutes, we have to then move into like the glutes and the hips and how the whole pelvis is functioning. The whole thing kind of comes together as a unit. So, um, okay. Another question here, is it late? And is there an issue leaving it too late? I've had two liver resections, full open surgery, bowel resection, ileostomy reversal and hernia repair. Um, no, it's never too late. Even after all of that, I've had five surgeries you can start to make progress and you can, it's never ever too late, but you must start at the very beginning, even if you're years post-op. So breathing, core, build it up. Okay. Um, so somebody says, they did some of my pre-recorded classes. Ah, oh, excellent. And worked their way up then had to stop for a while. Should they go back to the start or can they start where they stopped? <laughs> Good question. So my pre-recorded classes are just like layers built up. They're, they're available to sort of, to, to access online. Um, I'd go back a couple of levels, see how it feels. Don't just go back right to the beginning because there's also an issue with motivation. You don't want to go back to the really lame stuff. Go back halfway and build back up from there. Do we know the statistics of how much prehab core exercise can prevent a hernia? No, we don't. I would love to know that. That's a study that needs to be done. It will take years to get it. Um, what we do know is um, certainly in the patients we just work with, we just work with a group of 20 patients, small cohort, but we have seen uh, a reduction in size of hernia and we've also seen a reduction in symptoms with hernia so these are people with hernias so if we've had that result in people with hernias and hopefully we'll have that reduction in um prehab as well but no we haven't got that evidence yet wish we did do i know any good call uh, providers around breath work yes me <laughs> come to um, come to my classes i teach that in all of my classes on the ostomy studio um okay i have 
myasthenia gravis. I don't know what that is. So my immune system attacks my muscles. Oh, that doesn't sound very nice to make them weaker. Would you say to work more on my breathing exercise and which ones to do as I had a bowel up 12 weeks ago and now have lung cancer to starting chair yoga? So chair yoga is going to be great. Try not to worry about doing exercises. So um, I don't know how that condition affects you, but there's very few conditions where exercise does not help, but it needs to be the right type and the right dose. And it's all linked in with building your confidence. So um, definitely work on breathing exercises, but don't be too scared of those core exercises. Um, you know, safe pelvic tilts on the floor, working on the ball, those sorts of things. Um, all of that is really, really good. So don't worry. Um, Blah, blah, blah. are there any pelvic floor you would recommend apart from the quick flicks and long squeezes yeah so pelvic flexes are where you draw up and you flick and you hold for longer great but you have to incorporate it with the bigger picture so the whole um the whole core like we just talked about glutes so we start with the inner core we move to the outer core which is the abdominals and then we move to the extended core which is shoulders and your glutes and your quads and your thighs down to your knees. So it's not just the center. Okay. Um, I think we're pretty much running on time. Rob, have you got any last things to say? So if there's one piece of advice you could give to somebody who's having abdominal surgery, what would it be? Go. Don't be afraid to try things, but just do it in the right way. I would say you can, you can probably do anything you want to do. You just need to kind of have a plan um start off slowly and just and just build up and you'll get where you want to get to love it thank you um yeah don't be scared but respect the fact you've had surgery and uh, and find that sweet spot in the middle somewhere um yeah brilliant okay thank you i think we're done georgie on time yeah yeah well done thank you so much and thank you robin as well that was awesome to like listen to your insights and I thought I could tell that you were very you know kind of pilot mindset <laughs> but it was really interesting and thanks everyone for all your questions and we'll pop some um, links to to Sarah's website and everything like that in the email we'll, we'll probably send um tomorrow or Wednesday with a bit of a feedback survey as well so huge huge thanks Rob and Sarah and thanks everyone for listening so have a lovely evening and also this will be recorded if you want to pass on to anyone else who might find it useful we'll, we'll pop that link in the email as well so thank you very much thank you Sarah and Rob <laughs>